Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we'll call back into open session meeting of the Arlington Independent School District Board of Trustees for February 16th, beginning at 7.22 p.m. I want to thank everybody for coming out to be with us tonight. And uh, at the start of our meeting, will you please join Dr. Cavazos in leading us in the pledge? Thank you. And if you would uh, silence your cell phones and electronic devices and join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. First item on the agenda is programs and presentations. We have none. Appointments, we have none. Public hearings, we have none. We are smoking. Uh, open forum for agenda items, uh, we have no cards for the open forum. Uh, for under action items, uh, Mr. McCullough, I'd like to move uh, item B up to item A. We will consider EIA local academic achievement grading progress reports to parents first. Mr. McCullough. Thank you, Mr. Barron, President Barron, members of the board. This was discussed uh, at our last uh, board meeting. The administration is recommending approval. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Dr. Rice, second by Mr. Hibbs. Is there any discussion? Please vote. All voting in the affirmative. Thank you very much, committee. We have a new report card. You all can go home now. Okay. There they go. There they go. Thank you very much, ladies. Next item on the agenda is uh, consider high school class size data and staffing ratios for 2012-2013. Mr. McCullough. Uh, thank you, President Barron, members of the board. Uh, this is uh, uh, coming back in an action item, and uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Evans has a short presentation to make. Uh, we will not be going back over uh, any of the slides we did last time. You have those in your packet, but these will be uh, this will be new information tonight. So, Ms. Evans. President Barron, members of the board, and Superintendent McCullough, personnel department is here this evening to review a few items and discuss, and but most importantly, recommend approval of high school class size and ratios for the 2012-13 um, budget cycle. We are bringing um, information to you requested um, from last meeting. You requested a comparison of our class size average to comparison districts. Most importantly, those comparison districts that are high performing, either recognized or exemplary, and we're bringing that information before you. You will notice on this slide, um, comparison in the core subject areas. In English language arts, Arlington is at 19.4 and our comparison districts range from 15.3 to 21.8, so we are well within that range. Our math average is at 19.5, comparison districts are at 14.9 to 21.4. Science, we are also comparable at 20.1, uh, at a range of comparison of 16.0 to 23.5. Social studies, we are at 22.1, with a comparison ranged from 16.3 to 21, 25.1. You will also notice in our comparison districts that we, um, our per, per pupil expenditure is well within the range. We actually, we are well below our comparison at $6,760 um, per student. 
You will also notice that we are very comparable to this year's Bro Prize winner, um, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, our um, size, class size average as well within their range. Also, you um, asked about class size as far as those lower class sizes in comparison to large class sizes, the class size range, you will notice that um, our district is at 10.2% for class sizes that range from one to nine students. And those class sizes that are more than 50 students, we are only at 0.4%. We are at 49.2% for the majority of our classes ranging from 21 to 30 students. There was also discussion about our core classes, um, that class size average, those classes that are above 26. We brought you a recommendation for um, class size average at 26 for this coming school year of 2012-13. You will notice um, th these courses are those that are above the um, 26 class size average. They're represented by this slide and also the following slide. You will notice that most of those courses fall within the um, upper level, either pre-AP subject areas or AP subjects. Additionally, there was discussion about small classes. You will notice that these slides represent those classes that have students that are less than 10. Most cl um, small classes are driven by many variables, such as course requests, special funds, that would be our House Bill 1, class size reduction funds, um, state comp ed or Title I. Um, curriculum initiatives so, such as our star focus classes or academically unacceptable um, classes for um, initiative program initiatives as well as other program offerings. Um, those classes range most, uh, most importantly probably in our elective areas as represented by these slides. We wanted to bring um, information to you about class schedules for our teachers to represent how classes not only do our teachers have classes that are below that small class range of 10, but they also may have classes that are above that 26, but their overall class size average stays within that 26. You will notice that this is represented by a core teacher in language arts. You will notice that teacher has a small class of 11, but also has a class of 33, but overall that teacher's class size average is 24.4. Also have a representation here for you, a math class. Um, this cl teacher's class size average is 25, although there are classes that are above and below that class average. Representation also by a geometry teacher, as well as an IB. You will notice an IB was, on, was one of those subject areas that had classes that were below the 10, um, 10 students, and this teacher, you will notice, not only teaches um, classes that are below that 10, but also has a class represented at 26 for an overall class average of 10.9. This is a very um, unique situation in um, our IB offering for those students. This teacher is represented by IB and regular classes, and her class size averages, or he, he or she, um, would be 29 to, uh, to a small of six for a class, si class size average of 19.1. Career technology is one of those specialized areas, and you will notice that this teacher has um, overall class average of 11.4, classes ranging from a low of six to a high of, seven, of 18. We also have a representation in our technology area for you to review, and that overall class size average is 22.6. Our fine arts is one of those areas where um, our, our Teachers have specialized training and those classes are um, bundled together to um, give sometimes a very large appearance of class, such as 49, and that band, ensem band ensemble um, percussion, percussion one, two, and three, for a low class in the band on ensemble of woodwinds, one and two, for a class average of six. But overall, this teacher's class average is 20, so you would notice that it ranges from 49 to a low of six students. So what is that implications? The implications for this, we, um, you asked us to bring back to you a um, um, recommendation for core classes, a, cap of cl a capping of that class to not to exceed, and also um, what would that mean for our non-core classes. This evening we are recommending to you a core class cap at 26, and that will mean that 
given the ideal staffing um, master schedule, master schedule ideal is probably going to be a little challenging for us, but we are tr certainly going to attempt to make this happen. Um, with a core class ca cap at 26, <coughs> this may need, mean that some of our teachers who are now in that special duty area would, might have to be pulled into um, an extra section to, to avoid having to hire one teacher for an additional section on a campus. Um, and potentially could lead to needing more teachers at, at this time. <clears throat> Using the Moat Casey um, class average schedule, we will attempt to stay within that class size um, average of 26, capping the core at 26, and the non-core averaging at 26, but a maximum not to exceed <clears throat> at 30 in the non-core area. If um, campuses should have to have um, exceed this, we will do that by an exception that will be approved by administration. So Mrs. Clark is committed to monitoring that process to make sure that, this, that we can stay within these guidelines. Um, implications of minimum class size. At this time, we are not bringing a recommendation for minimum class size. We feel that, that um, if we go to a minimum of class size, this may potentially lead to the elimination of some courses and programs. It could increase class size in other um, courses if we were to eliminate those minimum, those smaller classes. It could decrease course choices for students Teachers might be uh, asked to teach outside their certified fields if we were to eliminate minimum class sizes. Additionally, um, it could lead to a split AB and ro AB rotation for teachers. Um, potentially could lead to some increased special duties because if those teachers have specialized um, certification and training, there wouldn't be other courses for them to teach, so it would increase the special duty assignments, and it could lead to some elimination of, of core teachers. So at this time, we are recommending um, the same recommendation we brought to you um, last meeting, a class average of 26 for um, a, a cost of $3.5 million to the district with a, um, approximately 26 additional teachers would be needed. As far as junior high class size, we are not making any additional changes in the recommendations that we brought you from last meeting. We are recommending on a class size average of 23, which is where our junior high junior high schools are currently staffed, and that would be a net savings to the district of approximately $220,000. Elementary staffing, we are um, not bringing any changes at this time. We are recommending to continue with the um, state compliance at pre-K pre through pre-K of 22 to 1 and our state compliance of kindergarten through fourth grade of 22 to 1, fifth grade at 26 to 1, and sixth grade at 30 to 1. At this time, our facilities at the elementary level cannot um, manage or cannot, we do not have capacity to lower class size at the elementary level due to, due to um, facility constraints. We'd like to consider your for consideration to, for us to move forward with our staffing schedule of February 17th through the 24th for elementary and secondary scheduling March 19th through the 28th. And at this time, we um, personnel department is here to answer any questions you may have. We have no lights. Mr. Hawk. Thank you, President Barron. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Let me ask a couple questions. Um, and just to clarify one thing you said, we have a core class cap at 26, but we do, I kind of call it a common sense exception. There is yes. a way, if I'm over by one, right. probably shouldn't hire a new teacher. Exactly. So that exception will be able to be processed through yes. on certain classes. Okay. That was one thing. Always want to make sure we don't ever want our policies taking away sometimes a common sense decision. Appreciate um, that. It's the least we can do on where it is. So, so let me ask, Ms. Evans, on, on this is going after some of these smaller class options. I understand the average of the teacher, and that's not a bad way to look at it, but I also have to look at it as, is it better to be in that smaller class, that pre-AP biology in sixth period with eight kids, or that pre-AP biology in fourth period with 22 kids? I would probably say it's better to be in that class with eight kids. I think it would um, depend on the instructional design of that teacher. Without a doubt. 
Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of studies that show class size has nothing to do with a highly effective right. teacher. I, I understand Dr. that Carter also. Provided you with some of that information. <clears throat> but on scheduling, we're adjusting those kids. And so I guess my question is, and then you st showed that slide back up with all of our foreign language, um, many that have small classes in some of our specialty. Are, are we offering too many options to students? I, I think given the um, credit and graduation plans, I would say no, we are meeting those graduation plans and making those options available for students. So some of our foreign language that you're mentioning there have smaller class sizes, and we offer those yes. at every single campus. I believe so. Ms. Clark, is that correct? Yes. Is there a way we could, on those small class sizes, um, could it only be offered at certain campuses? And I, I think now we're talking specialty classes of fourth year foreign language, specialty language. We could certainly explore those options. You would have to take into consideration transportation for those students, potentially loss of instructional time as they transport between campuses. So certainly we could explore that. Okay. And, and then, or they could be offered through, dis, I, mean, I understand foreign language may be hard in distance, and I'm not just talking foreign language, I'm talking in general, many of these. Could things be offered virtually or through distance learning? Distance learning, Mr. Harvey would be, certainly we could explore that option as well. We have explored that in the past. And, and I'm not saying any answer I have. I'm saying I just, I have to think of all the offerings we offer. We offer, I think, many more subjects and, and, and a variety of classes for students. And I think that's a good thing, but I think we can also still offer those on a scaled down with some maybe creativity thinking from our side of how we can move them to certain campuses. Um, some of our specialty IB classes, um, I'm probably one of the biggest IB supporters out there. Um, I think it is outstanding program what it is, but I also see some classes with four students should only be offered at one campus. Um, and maybe that's only offered first period, and that period starts 15 minutes earlier so that then students can be bused if they need to or drive their own cars to their own campus um, to get back for second period for that specialty class. Mm -hmm. And if that's a specialty class you want to take, that's the period you have to take it. There's not another option. We can Some of those things I think this board needs to think about of how we discuss those. And the next question I have, you kind of answered it, but I'm a little concerned. So our fifth and sixth grade class ratio will be larger than our junior high ratio? That's correct. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for me, except for that one little our caveat you threw in there right. of our facility Facilities, size. we have facility concerns at this time, yes. But if we didn't have the facility concerns, you would probably be wanting to make that recommendation of 23 students in our fifth and sixth grade. Because going from 22 <laughs> to 28, I think is what we go 26 to. 26 and fifth and 30 and sixth grade. 30 and sixth grade. grade? Yes. I have a new level of respect for our sixth grade teachers. It's a lot of students. Yes. And then going back to 23 and seventh grade. I already have a lot of respect for seventh grade teachers, <laughs> but 23 is at least a little more respectable. Um, that's concerning, having that fifth and sixth grade number being so high. That is a major concern. I understand by the state we're regulating K through four class size, but that fifth and sixth grade number, I think, will cause further discussion. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Mr. Papa. Thank you, President Barron. <clears throat> um, thank you for shortening the presentation. Thank I appreciate you. it. I think it'll help move, move things along a, a, a little bit better pace. Um, some of my observations uh, are similar to what Mr. Hogg's observations were. Uh, obviously, considering distance learning for any of these, I think uh, universities have, have demonstrated to us that just about any class can be taught using distance learning, in, including language classes. So. It, 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 especially in those classes that are the more advanced where we have limited uh, participation, I think those would be great uh, to, do, to do that. But uh, once we start looking at that, uh, not limit ourselves to, that, to, to only those classes, but uh, just the concept of distance learning and helping us uh, reduce our, our need for, uh, for staffing costs. So that, that'd be great. Um, I'll tell you right off the top uh, that on the high school class size, uh, I'd like to see our overall average around 27, so we only have to hire an additional 31 teachers at $1.7 million uh, in terms of our budget. I just like that better. 
Well, that's not a question, that's a comment. Um, okay, so tell me on um, our average size, maybe I'm, I'm reading this wrong, but right now, if you go back to the, to the slide where you're comparing us to other, to other districts, and so, I, well, it, I don't know. Okay, that was on, on our page five. Uh, yeah, that one. Okay, so we're showing an average of 19.4, 19.5. These are our core classes. Those are averages, right? Those are averages across the district, given all the different funds. Reminder that the 26 will be local funds only before we add those additional variables to it, such as um, our House Bill 1 funds and, and the like. That slide that we had previously. Okay, that was going to be my question. Why the, 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 the big difference between the 26 and what, what we see there? Because of these variables, when, remember the 26 is a baseline. Okay. And then when you start adding in the different variables, that lowers your class size. Okay. And this, the, the average that is reported to in our PEAMS report is, includes all funding. Okay. All right. I got that. And then why, why 26? Um, 26 as opposed to 27 or 25? We what? settled on 26 based on that December meeting that we had back when we were talking about going back from the 7 out of 8 to the 6 out of 8. We said it would take about 60 teachers, and this, this brought us closest to that. This will be 63 teachers and brings us close to that $3.5 million that we committed to in December. Okay, so not based on any idea of how the, the performance of the, how it would affect the performance of the students' achievement or anything like that, just kind of on this is where we were before and this is kind of what we know. And That's so, correct. Okay, and, and again, this is what I think brings me to, to the idea that, hey, we pushed ourselves, we could per perhaps get to 27 and take the savings there and utilize that money in, in, in other ways. Um, so uh, that was my point there. And Okay, so the same, the same question that Mr. Hogg had about the junior high uh, size of classes, and I mean, that's just, you know, to have that big a class in sixth grade and then drop down to 23 uh, jumped out at me, but those were my only comments. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Sullins. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I do have a few questions this evening. We. Um, have some information on on the cost impact on different strategies that we could or cla class sizes do we have the cost if we wanted to uh, lower the class size in core possibly ninth grade and uh, the academy classes at the high school so we'd have a different average for certain so we so we uh, deploy more teaching resources to where they're needed most we did not look at the cost per se of that Ms. Sullins but we said that that would be within that allocation of units given the Mocasey model if it said that that campus was entitled to you know 50 teachers 75 teachers that if we lowered within that core area the, the principal would have to carve that out first and then use the remaining allocation for other course other subject areas so to remain within that, that cost factor. I, I appreciate everyone's work, and I think often of teachers having different numbers of preps, different grading loads, especially the teacher that's teaching a very important skill of writing. Uh, essay grading is time consuming, mm -hmm. and when you have a, uh, a large, you have the same class count as <coughs> the rest of the school, that, that one teaching group has a tremendous uh, grade bur grading burden and I want to certainly encourage our teachers to spend as much time with with feedback I'm concerned about the, um, the all classes being a one-size-fit-all formula and going at it with a formulaic formulatic approach at all I like the idea of some strategic staffing initiatives that deploy resources to students based you know, prior to prioritizing the need of the um, of the individual learner and in regards to small classes I wonder sometimes if we have another option here we look at a class average or an actual cap of minimum and max and that becomes problematic I understand that sometimes um, classes can even be in the 30s and be very successful my own my own children went through some classes that had some very large class sizes like that and they were very productive and there's a, a time where maybe a class is an evolving course but this chronic 
ex uh, law, um, existence of low number classes. If we're not going to adjust it here, what, what it, do, we, do we have a long-term plan on how we're going to go about that? Or could we also look, instead of doing a, an average or a cap, say we have a cap with exception. So we're, we still have the cap, but instead of it being an average, say these, these courses, I need an, an extra section of AP this or, or what have you. So it's not just one big blur of a calculation. It's, it's more of a, a, a small class size exception and justification. We are, we are recommending that this evening. Are you? Okay. A cap with exception and the administration would, would monitor that and principals would be able to to um, conference with um, Ms. Clark, myself, and Mr. McCullough on, on areas of need that they think that they would need an exception for. Okay, well, Ms. We'll Evans, uh, that, that, is, that is the plan to put a cap of 26 on the core areas. And then if we go above that, then uh, personnel would talk with the principal, uh, see if, why they're above 26, uh, what the reasoning is, and then we could, at, we could uh, I could approve a, an exception uh, if I don't feel like that, you know, that they've uh, looked at it hard enough, you know, they need to go back to the drawing board, but uh, that is our plan to put a cap of 26 on core areas. It's not just an average in the uh, language arts, math, science, and history. Maximum student load per core teacher is 26 times 7? Or yes. times six, because we're going to six, six out okay. of eight next six, year. Six, yeah. And then the, excuse me, the electives could go up to 30. And what about the um, uh, superintendent, the classes that have been below 10? Um, if we don't make a change on, on capping that this evening, what is the long-term strategy to get those class sizes either bigger or phased out? or maybe we could redeploy some of that labor. Is it, I believe that um, is a lot of our tutoring done by substitute teachers now that maybe some of these teachers that had freed up hours that, that are certified teachers could tutor um, students? It depends on uh, you know, their, their background. Uh, there be, might be some teachers that uh, have a uh, special duty that uh, you know, has math background. Uh, Personally, if, if I was a high school teacher and I, and I had a, a uh, special duty period and they came and asked me to tutor uh, in a math course that was more than fifth grade math, you know, I would be real concerned about that. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, it becomes very difficult for some teachers uh, to have the, uh, uh, the, that knowledge that would be able to help them but it is something we would study very carefully. The, the lower classes of uh, 10, that is something I think as I heard Mr. Pompa and Mr. Hogg saying, you know, let's look at different options that we can offer mm -hmm. uh, in the future. Uh, that would be part of our, uh, our planning or even part of our strategic plan as we're going through it is, uh, is to work to incorporate some of those ideas uh, into our curriculum. Some of these, the, the listing of the small class sizes, it looked a bit more of a coding. When I look at a, say, a Latin one class, it looked like that was maybe the eighth grade component, but the ninth grade students are in the same classroom, so it's not really a classroom head count. It was a, is, it, is it true that's more of a coding because in one period of Latin one, you'd really have one teacher, but some of the students would be coded one way because they're eighth grade, and another set of the students would be coded another way because they're ninth or, or up. So really, they're not a small class size of under 10 students. It's a teacher with 26 plus. Right, there is some stacking for that. In, in, in that list. So, yes. so we look at the types of, um, uh, yes. When we look at, at this chart, what we would uh, what would be interesting is what the classroom number is, and not the coding per teams or yes, you know. So, um, <coughs> my uh, reiterating a point that I uh, would like for us to also consider um, academy separately. We are looking at we um, the academy classrooms have, have been successful. They are I believe those teachers have a very large workload, and I believe 26 could be an aggressive number in our academies. 
you're asking that the uh, the uh, cap on our academies be lower, if it's mm -hmm. what, what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can look at that. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to, you know, that uh, uh, is, is something that we're going to evaluate. You know, we have two years of experience at Arlington High with the academy. Right. We have one year at Lamar and Sam, but uh, that's something we can address on uh, the uh, success. And, and going forward, possibly in key transition years like ninth grade and seventh grade, when we know we have um, uh, struggling yeah, populations struggling. that maybe we should be looking at a strategic staffing initiative that matches resources with demand rather than a straight across approach. Uh, I think your key, key word there <laughs> matches resources mm -hmm. uh, with what we can provide. But I, I do think the key, you know, seventh grade is a key time and ninth grade is a key time. So uh, I think we're, everybody's on the same page there, but uh, it's the matching our resources with that without over burdening some other courses as we, we make those adjustments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Pena. Thank you. Well, along the same lines, um, let me ask you a question. I know Sam Houston High School has a cosmetology program. Do each of our high schools have a program? Ms. Clark, can you come forward? Not just for cosmetology. Like I know there's Project Lead the Way that I expect that all the high schools offer for an engineering angle, but are there specific programs like cosmetology that are at the different high schools? Um, cosmetology is only at Sam Houston, and all students that are interested in cosmetology go to Sam Houston to receive that course. Um, ROTC is only at Arlington High School, so all those students that are interested in ROTC go to Arlington High School. Project Lead the Way is at each of our campuses. Okay, are there any other kind of programs like that that we offer? Because the point I'm trying to make here is that we already provide transportation to other students in other high schools to go to the campuses that have those programs that Mr. Hogg was alluding to. Uh, and Ms. Evans said that transportation was an issue. But if we're already providing the transportation um, to students that want to go to the other high schools, I don't know why it's an issue. Okay, well, we do, just to answer your question, we only have the cosmetology and the ROTC, and then those are the only two programs currently that are so Local Lamar us. doesn't have a, an emphasis that they do that in the medical no. area? and No, because in that medical area, all six of the high schools have that health science technology. Okay. Okay. All right. But, but given what, <coughs> what my point still is, is that we do offer transportation to students. How do we advertise to other students that those programs are available? Well, that's one of those that may be more of a curriculum and counselor and Dr. Cavazos question. Well, but, and so it's, it's, it's not course. something I really need an answer. It's kind of a rhetorical question right. because well, my, it's, in my, the cor it's in the course offerings. They, they know that they have that option because it's in that, that district course offering book. And then in there, um, I believe it says what campuses those are offered at. Well, I said, I remember attending that with my daughter mm -hmm. and I never heard about it until one day I was at Sam Houston and um, meeting the students and they were so proud of of the program they kind of did the PR to me so yes. I got to hear it firsthand from them. Um, Ms. Pena, uh, I'm glad you mentioned this because uh, this is something that Mrs. Casas and I and Dr. Cavazos have been discussing in the in past few weeks about uh, getting the words out uh, and, and Ms. Sullins uh, uh, we've, I've had conversations with you about getting the word out on, the, on our different offerings so students know about it. Uh, and we uh, we really right now cre uh, depending on our counselors and word of mouth and, and just our and some of our instructors to get that word out. But uh, we really need to. I, I'm I'm shocked sometimes to find out that parents are not aware of some of the course offerings that you, <coughs> you were just mentioning that you heard about it. But uh, that's uh, that's in a, a plan that we're trying to put together uh, of offering uh, our. Uh, getting the word out about these courses. Thank you. Well, and the other thing is I think that um, the other angle which both Mr. Hogg and uh, Mr. Pampa stated about uh, going, uh, doing things online, distance learning, I don't, I think that that's no longer a choice that we not do it. I think that that's a direction we must address and go to. If we're truly preparing the students, then we need to offer them real world uh, experience which is online learning 
And so that should help and eliminate some of the problems that we think we have, but there is a solution and it may not be the solution for February, but I think it's one we really need to, to seriously look at. I don't think we're looking at online as opposed to distance learning, which is a teacher in one classroom projecting to kids who are on a video screen in the other classroom across the district. We have that capability right now. And so we could do it with some of these high level classes already and, Absolutely. and eliminate it's, it. It's a rollout cart that the teacher just brings it into the room. Well, I think that's an answer to part of this. Yeah. Mr. Hogg. Thank you, President Barron. Ms. Pena, I know, example, FFA is only, Future Farmers of America is only offered at Arlington and Martin High School. So, so other students do. We do allow transfer then if they do want to transfer over to that class or can they go over just for that class? <laughs> See all the See above. All the above. Yeah. So they can transfer officially to the high school or just take that one class at yes. that school. Yes. As a future farmer of America from Arlington High School, I'm proud to see that it's still occurring. I didn't I did not mean to exclude the farmers. That's okay. Me. It's they're excluded a lot. They're used to it and what's happening. Um you can see how much I'm farming, but I did learn a lot. I learned a lot in that I learned how to weld and do electricity in that class and learned I wanted to go to college and not do that. So um Let's get a, I want to get a clarification real quick on Ms. what Ms. Payne, on, I'm sorry, not Ms. Pena, Ms. Solon says. We're talking teacher class size, not subject size. And on that clarification, I guess my example would be Latin 3 may only have 8 students and Latin 4 may have 6 students, but they're in the same class. So that could be 14 in a classroom. That's, is that, that correct? That was are stacked. Those so so when I say stacked, a yes. small cap on the lower side, I think it's just for, I call it class size versus subject size. And so I, I don't know if there's better clarification words on the head count of the teacher. Um, I think my concern and what I'm hearing from my colleagues is we don't want a class with eight students in a classroom, a teacher and eight students. I don't think that's effect, uh, efficient use of dollars. So, so that's the concern right there. My concern is, and we talked about how do we get these students knowing about these classes, pretty simple. Teachers need to be recruiting for their classes. If you're teaching a specialty subject, you better be getting students in that classroom and one to take that class. And you can do things by staggering teacher schedules. I know high school schedules are a nightmare to plan, but if students know early, Latin 4 is only offered in the fall semester at these two high schools. That's something that can be adjusted um, or there, or the teachers are coming in. So getting the teachers to recruit is the big thing of what we're, what we're truly looking at. I don't think from a board's perspective, this is something that should be in place for this next year, but I do think this is something that for this next year, it should almost be like a probationary year where this is your year, your last year, you're gonna have a small class size. After next year, and this year's reviewed, because my belief is that if a class doesn't have more than 10 students two years in a row, that class is not relevant anymore. I don't believe that class is needed. I'm not saying it's not needed in the district somewhere, it's definitely probably not needed on that campus. And it can adjust. Well, then if you have 20 students signed up for a certain subject and it's coming up, you grow it. And it's almost like a, you have a probationary year. One year you can drop below the 10. Great, I'll tolerate it. Year two, yeah, it happens again. We're not going to fill that class. That class is going to be staggered or we're going to stagger the teacher's schedule where now you're teaching a zero hour and you don't have a last hour of the day. I mean, there's all kinds of adjustments I think we need to make, and I think we can't tolerate, and, and once again, the clarification, <coughs> class size versus subject size. You can't tolerate a class, and I don't, I don't care what subject it is, I don't care how much it's important, and as much as I love FFA, if they don't have enough students, they should not be filling that class, because obviously it's not effective use of dollars. So I think that's something the board needs to look at and say, okay, this year, this is a probationary year we're building up, but after this next year, you've got to be hitting those class sizes growing, because I do think we're, 
not so far behind the eight ball, but we've got to build up to that point where we're saying, here's, here's the class size. There's not going to be one teacher and eight students in a classroom. I, I just don't think what that is. And if there is a special exception, kind of like what I said before, there's always room for a common sense exception. Um, we've got to allow, you guys are all very good professionals, and I know how good of a job you do. Um, I've got to allow you to use your common sense on certain subjects. Um, I know there's some subjects that may need that, but that's a special exception that would come up to the superintendent for special approval. Dr. Reich. Thank you, President Barron. I'll have to just uh, say that I agree with all the comments that I've heard from my colleagues at this point. Um, I'd be very interested in hearing something for us to explore more regarding strategic staffing initiatives uh, that Ms. Sullins recommended uh, that we may look at. Um, there definitely has to be something as far as a, an official plan to increase enrollment in these under-enrolled classes or look at them as ineffective, non-relevant, and perhaps getting rid of them. Um, as one trustee, I'm very concerned that we don't have more efforts being poured into that. Uh, <coughs> devils in the details. These little under-enrolled courses add up to a lot of dollars, and we went through a horrific budget process last year this time, and we had big swaths of, of people and uh, programs at stake, i.e. strings, cooking, uh, probationary teachers. There were so many big swaths of things on the table. And that's, then we get to where we are here with the under-enrolled classes and the MGT study stating 30% reduction would equate to, I think it was $5 million of savings. Uh, devil's in the details, it adds up. So I really think we should uh, look at those deeper. Um, regarding that MGT uh, study, I was hoping that we would hear a little bit more on the analysis, uh, the, the study of that 30% <coughs> reduction. Uh, that's what we thought we were gonna get last week. And we've touched on some details here, but just tonight in the dais, uh, Mr. Pomp and Hogg, discussed uh, virtual or distance learning and it almost seems like oh this is an idea that we're suggesting we're coming up with but it isn't something that we've heard as part of the decision making analysis for the MGT 30 percent reduction as an example I just I don't know that there's been enough uh, attention paid uh, to that uh, so I, I hope there's more uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to just complain, but that, that frankly bothers me. Um, the question that I have on these under-enrolled courses, specifically, I, I would think the electives. Right now, we could assume that it's under-enrollment due to lack of relevance in a student's eyes, or it could be under-enrollment due to lack of marketing or them understanding that it's relevant, as Mr. Hogg was stating. What do we do as part of our process to define what those electives are and how they begin? Is it an idea that comes from uh, central administration, uh, from market studies, that th this is a direction we need to start priming our children for? Is it an idea from a, a uh, one teacher that has an idea, hey, I'm good at this, maybe we could offer this? Where, where do we base the, the, the need and the relevance for those uh, topics that are most likely, uh, specifically, that would probably be under enrollment courses that we're looking at tonight. Right now, those primarily come from um, student request, course offerings, um, counseling that they might have with their um, guidance counselor on um, providing them with those options and, and recruiting really from within the departments, the Kate department going out and making presentations in classrooms for um, lower um, the lower grade level so that when they get to the upper grades they know what's available for them. Okay, and is there, uh, 
everything at this point is is formula driven is there any any formula for that determination if, if say it's a, a student driven process do you have a formula that dictates we've got X number of hits on this and therefore it's an automatic trigger that we're going to do further study to try to bring this in as one of our new classes or is it just a well sounds good let them try to run with it it's not a formula process at this time now okay 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 I would uh, in, in coming to a decision tonight I, I think uh, Mr. Pompa had a, a, a good idea uh, the, the data is conflicting as far as class size and achievement and uh, maybe to push from 26 to 27 might be a, a good thing. Uh, our overall number is going to still come in lower, right, Ms. Evans? Once you put in all the other factors, that's what you stated, that we're, uh, we'll have the cap, obviously, at, at 26 or if we do 27, but the average, as you've shown, is going to be a lot lower than that well, that's typically. As, as that um, slide demonstrate that's going to vary from campus to campus um, based on their different um, additional funds that are available for those campuses so right. those opportunities will not be the same for all students sure okay and in previous years has there been a a 26 cap or it's just no. been the average it's just been an average and first time and, and as far as using that formula uh, methodology the uh, the average class size numbers by campus or district average would you say we're on an increase it's pretty well level over the past five six years we've what? used a divisor in the past and that has been a mere estimate at best okay that's why we are recommending this Mo Casey model so that we can be more definitive and what that true base will be okay. we feel like this will give us a true base okay okay all right well I think uh, this this is good discussion and I, I do think there's things that we have to work in uh, regarding our strategic plan uh, regarding achievement uh, transportation issues we can talk about transportation we do have the mechanism set up uh, already for getting kids from point A to point B I really think distance learning is a good way to go. Uh, Mr. Pompa mentioned college uh, ideal in that arena, and we do people all over the state all the time in many different classrooms. One instructor works beautifully. And if we already have those mechanisms in place, there, I would think we could positively impact our budget immediately for this next cycle by utilizing that. So I don't know how that plays into this equation tonight. Uh, if we have to take that into account or if you have to come back to us with an adjustment there, I'm not really sure where we go to try to make that a, a reality into this coming budget. But uh, I just put that out there for other comments. That's all I have right now. Thanks. Thank you. A couple more questions, please. Uh, when I look at, on my handout, page 13, which has two slides, which is high school class size and it has the average class size, the net teachers, and the cost across the top. It shows the, the different price tags for the high school level. Yes, that's the one. When I, when I read that, it says, doesn't say anywhere to me that that's the core classes, that's the average. So is that the price if everybody had a cap of 26? That's an average of 26, and within that average, we would cap the core at 26. So would, would those numbers be lower if we said core only is, is lower? No, our, it actually would probably be a little higher, but we are saying that within this allocation of FTEs that we would give, that a campus would be allocated, we would carve out the core classes first, and to remain within that allocation, they would have to, the other classes would be a little higher. So the other classes would, ha would have higher Enrollments. That's what right. non-core, the non-core the non -core classes, and, and that's already and factored into your pricing here. Yes. I'm looking at the price tag at this yes. point. Yes, so make, make sure that we, you know, we uh, understand that. I um, have a question about sixth grade, and we are looking at large class sizes in sixth grade. It's an important year, the year before a large transition year, and we have a, a unusual cir uh, circumstance that we have a facilities limitation. I would like to this evening um, acknowledge. I see Mr. Bob Carlisle sitting in the in the um, 
audience and I appreciate all the work that his group is doing to quickly remedy and alleviate this but it just it can't happen overnight so I, first of all I'd like to applaud the work of uh, Mr. Bob Carlisle but second of all I would like the board to consider that we may and Mr. Superintendent maybe there's something already there some interim interventions in these sixth grade and fifth grade large classrooms in terms of maybe some co-teachers teachers aides some kind of uh, help for the sixth grade teacher that has so many kids in those classrooms. You may already have that in place, I'm not sure, but I would entertain um, I would gladly providing some support to those teachers. We, we do have in place, you know, it's a 30 cap. Now, we, we already are, are using sort of the, if you go above 30, you know, the exception. Um, uh, principal, teacher, say, well, you know, I'd rather go up to 32 than split the class or those types of things, even if we had the room available. Uh, now, uh, most of the sixth grade classes are, I wouldn't say most, uh, Ms. English, would you come down for a second? Uh, no, you don't want to? <laughs> now this, uh, uh, it's a uh, tough work around here, you know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, across the different, we have 50 elementary schools in our sixth grade. Are they all running around 30, or are we below 30 in, in some areas? We're area? below 30. And you, can you kind of give us a little bit more than, you know, are we at 29 or uh, 28? Uh? It will range in uh, different sizes depending upon the number of units that are there once you divide out. It, it really varies. We can go as low as 24, and then I think the highest ones that we're having across a sixth grade say in one campus would be like 29 point something at this point in time. We have gone up as high as 30. Um, I have to give accolades to the elementary teachers mm -hmm. and their principals because I'm elementary at heart. But um, sometimes we have situations and we're allowed to do it in grades five and six because that's a district decision to set you know, what we want our ratio to be. And the uh, principals visit with teams whenever they go over the amount, either over the 26 for grades five or over 30 for grade six. And sometimes the teachers will sign off on a letter saying, we don't want to divide our classes. We don't think it's good for kids to divide and split mm -hmm. at this point in time and year. And I think sometimes their efforts go unnoticed. And so at this time, I, I would like to give them accolades. Absolutely. The um, other thing is as we're going to go through staffing, and look at it, we try to take into consideration if they're sitting on 30, it looks like it's gonna be 30 in a classroom, and the superintendent isn't hearing this right now, I'm going ahead with the teacher because the tilt factor is there. And it's terrible to take a group of children and disperse them again after school starts. So we try mm -hmm. to avoid that. Because mm -hmm. that's just like they're moving to a different campus when you do that to them. And I appreciate the stability you give the students in that. I think that's when uh, Mr. Hogg was mentioning earlier, sometimes we have to have the common sense e exception. I guess my question is, do we need to provide any additional resources to the sixth grade teacher in terms of an aid or classroom support that had the, 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 the small number of people that have those really large numbers have, have, a, um, have a job on their hands? I think it's something that needs to be considered. Um, either a co-teacher to go in to assist mm -hmm. or perhaps a teaching assistant to help them with some of the duties and mm -hmm. different activities that they have to do with the students. Um, their, their day is quite full whenever they get that many students mm -hmm. and the size of the elementary classrooms and the furniture and the technology that they're trying to incorporate through their learning stations that they have in their classrooms it's taking up more space but on the same hand we have to have that in there in order to advance with our students. And so it, it does get crowded in some situations. Not, not all classrooms are the same. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to have the flexibility and be able to grant that flexibility to a campus whenever they're reaching out at maximum as to what they think they need. Mm -hmm. I agree, okay. okay. Uh, thank you, that was, that was it, Mike. Those are all my questions. Mr. Pompa. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Barron. I had one more question that popped into my mind. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, you gave us financial impact for the high school recommendation. 
and then you gave us a uh, financial in impact for the junior high recommendation. What is the financial impact for the elementary recommendation? At elementary, we did not give you any impact until we um, go through staffing and see where we are with um, increased due to staffing and uh, due to enrollment projection, projections. But there was no um, increase due to us making any recommendation for lower class size. Okay, so we don't really have any sense of what the cost of the staffing is going to be as it compares to this year? That's correct. It would be, it's based on our enrollment projection, and, and we have not gone through elementary staffing at this time to make that projection. Okay. We'll have uh, those numbers at the end of elementary um, staffing. Which is when? Um, if we were given the go tonight, then that'll be at the end of this month. <coughs> I see. So that's your timeline. Could uh, you repeat? You said if we were given the go tonight, it would be what? The end of this month. End of this month? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that, that's your timeline there, the 24th, I guess. The, the, your conference is 17th through the right. 24th, and then after you establish that, then you can come back and report to right, us. Right, we, we could come back and report those elementary numbers. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of um, ideas on how to solve the, ch the staffing challenge and it sounds to me like a lot of it is has to do with you know we're, we, we really don't want to see classes that are less than 10 students uh, putting a cap you've made your point in terms of some of the pros and cons uh, about putting a cap on it but that's what I'm hearing from from our, uh, <coughs> the board members up here um, maybe more strategies on uh, be more strategic versus formulaic on approaches to staffing is what I'm hearing from Ms. Ms. Solins. And so um, it, it seems to me like we're going to overall just looking for more efficiency, being more effective with, uh, with our resources. Um, but what, I, what, 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 I, what I'm kind of thinking here is that uh, if, if, what, if what we're trying to accomplish is just to be more efficient with our resources, perhaps I'll go back to my recommendation earlier of you recommended a 26 average uh, ratio, maybe doing a 27 and allowing you to go out and figure out how you're going to become more efficient to be able to hit those numbers. Uh, you know, I mean, you're the professionals. I'm not a professional. I don't know all the ins and outs and the intricacies of, of staffing and everything that goes involved, but it sounds like there's obviously some uh, some alternatives, and, and there's there's different ways of, 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 of addressing this and approaching this. But what we're looking for, it sounds to me, be more strategic about the rate the, the staffing, but also being more efficient with it. Uh, and so that's why I just go back to saying, let us, you know, approve a 27 to one ratio. You guys go figure out using all the different ideas that we have here, and I'm sure you, you guys have a ton more ideas on how we can do this, uh, since this is what you do, uh, and then, you know, allow for that, allow for that to happen. So, um, is it appropriate for me to make a motion on this, if, if I, if I want to go ahead and move that? Can I ask my questions first? Sure. And then I'll go back to you. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, let me clarify a few things, I hope. Um, it always bothered me in the technology applications field that we had to go hunting for students. And like Mr. Hogg was saying, we really recruited to get our kids to come in and take computer science and all of the more technical classes. And the part that bothered me is that Career and Tech had what seemed like unlimited funds, and they could actually send letters out to families. And that happened again this year. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Yes. How many letters did they send out? 7,000. 7,000. Okay. So that's a little leg up on the current tech as far as getting kids to take their courses, and yet we still have really small class sizes in career and tech. Hmm. Um, I guess I'm okay with some small class sizes, especially for things like band and orchestra that have such strange setups, uh, as long as the teachers average load is, is within reason. Okay. I have strong heartburn about that IB that's up there that was low across the board. Um, Ms. Evans, about special duty, do we have 
teachers doing special duty assignments that could be better handled by uh, uncertified per personnel such as uh, say lunch duty or anything like that? Yes, you will notice on that slide that there was special duty that fell into those categories that, d d that does not require certified personnel, yes. But we have teachers doing those jobs? Yes, we do. Because they don't have kids to teach? Right. Then we have too many teachers. Okay. Well, in some in specialized that, areas. In that area, that's right. We need to fix that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harvey, tech trainers. Yes, sir. Did we change the program for coming into this year for tech trainers? Yes, we did. Do they still have a duty period? They do not have a duty period unless the campus has specifically, with their allocation, given them one. In, in general, they do not have an extra period. Okay, so they should have come off that special duty list. Well, the, the special duty is on there because you might find a campus who has said, we want our tech trainer for some reason to have it. So that was on there as the it's a possibility. It doesn't mean that they all get it. Okay. That was it for you. Thank oh. you. See, that was easy. Go back. <laughs> I have a theory on under enrollment. Because we're on A B block. <laughs> because we're on AB block, we're offering 32 credits. Yes. And how much? Do, how many credits do the kids need to graduate on a, the recommended plan? 20, 28, 26. Dr. Cavazos says 26. 26. Okay. And on the uh, minimum plan? Minimum plan, 24. 24. And I'm I'm just guessing here that quite a few of our seniors then have uh, late arrival and early release because they've already passed tax and they don't care anymore. Probably many of our seniors okay, So do those have are all those electives option. that in those classes that go unfilled because the kids aren't even <coughs> in school for those periods. That's just my guess. Could we get, not now, but sometime maybe by next meeting a number of this year's students, how many early release and late arrival periods we have? Certainly, we could provide that information. I think that would be a real eye-opener. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of board members mention the MGT report tonight of, is regarding uh, small class sizes. Yes. Was MGT informed of the fact that career and tech sort of doesn't fall into the same category as everybody else? when they got their numbers? Uh, or were the career and tech small classes included in the MGT report? Did you have any conversations with MGT when they were here? Yes, sir, I did have the opportunity to speak with them, but our discussions were not about class sizes or or funding of, of courses. So I did not have any conversations with them that would have indicated to them that those career tech courses um, are, had those different funds. Well, they got their numbers from somebody. Right, it, it wasn't from Roger Clark. <laughs> it was PEMS data. Just straight PEMS data? data? It could have been PEMS data, could have been their own experience here in the, in the state. Uh, we're, not, we're not sure how they did. Yeah. Um, Dr. Rice, did you have a quick question? Because Mr. Papa is just chomping at the bit over there to make a, a motion. It, it's a quick question. Okay, um, go ahead. Regarding the elective classes, uh, the under-enrolled classes, I, do we have trend data tracking each course? I, I would think we do to see over the years uh, whatever topic it may be, um, do we have that trend data to show year after year there's consistently eight kids per class for that particular topic, uh, overall number of students for those topics compared to others? Do we have that? Do we track that? Mr. Harvey? We 
Okay. I'm just thinking further analysis just to see what's, what's relevant, what's useful, what's effective. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Pompa. Thank you, President Barron. Um, I think in light of the discussion tonight and what I'm hearing from everyone, I would uh, like to make a motion that we approve the recommended uh, staffing ratios uh, as, uh, as recommended by the administration with the exception of the high school class size to uh, make that an average class size of 27. I would second that. Motion by Mr. Pompa, second by Dr. Rice to accept the administration's uh, recommendations with the exception that the average, the average class size for the high school would be 27. Thank you. Mr. Hawk. Thank you. Mr. Pompa, I think that's a good motion. Ms. Evans, I guess this question would go to you and Ms. Powell. By having an adjustment, and what are we doing to ensure no errors occurred like one of our colleague boards and districts to the west of us had occur and possibly over hired teachers or over under allocated their budget what what security places do we have in place to ensure that is not occurring we have district? a position within the personnel department called position inventory specialists that no position goes hired or no position is allocated without a position control number Okay. And so making this type of adjustment where you guys were thinking 26 to 27, no concern over us ha making an, having an error occur like our colleagues to the west and I think our colleagues to the east did a couple of years ago also. We will closely monitor so that that does not happen. That's all I needed to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Further discussion on the motion? Please vote. Six zero, the motion passes. I'm sorry, six one. Next item on the agenda is to consider the electricity contract extension. Mr. McCullough. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, this is, uh, uh, has been brought to us by uh, Mr. Carlisle and uh, Mrs. Powell, and that we have a contract with uh, uh, our electricity company. Uh, the uh, gas prices, uh, natural gas prices, are probably as low as we've ever seen. And we have an opportunity to uh, extend our contract with these lower gas prices, uh, which will approximately save us a million dollars. Uh, is that correct, Mr. Carlisle? Potentially about 850 uh, if we can get the price we need. I, I need to come to the, okay. I think we've estimated uh, we had some really low prices within the last two weeks, and we estimated that that would save about $850,000 a year. Since then, they've begun to creep up a little bit. Uh, what we would like the opportunity would be to uh, to watch the uh, watch this pricing, and if we can gather anything under an, under five cents a kilowatt hour, uh, we ought to extend that contract, and uh, so it gives us the opportunity to to take a look and, and make some good choices for uh, some savings beginning in the, the year, budget year 15, I believe, of uh, January of, of 2015. So our contract runs through uh, 15 or uh, 2014? Yeah, it, the, the new contract will go into effect, it's two years, it'll go into effect January of 13 and uh, would expire, uh, yeah, end of 15. So we'd have those out years past that. We have an opportunity perhaps to uh, to get some better pricing than we even have now. And we're, uh, y'all have asked uh, the board to consider allowing the superintendent to uh, uh, sign off on that agreement if, if the prices drop before. Yes, sir. Okay. That's correct. And that's the recommendation from administration. Mrs. Pena. 
you know, I read so much material that sometimes I, I blend over what my job, what I read about our city, what I read about the school district. So let me ask you this. Was it us who had some kind of an agreement with an electric company where if you, if homeowners moved over to that electric company that some money came back to the district? No, ma'am. He's saying yes. Was well, it we, one we, time? We, yeah, we, we did. We, uh, uh, it, uh, if a company, if they move from one electric company to another, or to the Reliant, I believe it is, oh, that uh, so much money would go to the to their home school. Is that correct, Ms. Costas? Yes, but okay. it was um, only if you move up $25 a month or something like that. Only, she's saying it was only $25 a month. Um, well, I guess my point is, what impact does that have with this change? It doesn't have, doesn't have any impact. This is, that's completely different. Yeah. Okay. It, but it referred to some, I thought it referred to an electrical company. It is electric, but uh, they, make elect, they make electricity by using natural gas, and uh, the and prices for natural gas are, are very, very low now. And if it goes below five cents a kilowatt hour, yes. hour uh, then we would want to uh, extend that contract because it, it would, could save us. Uh, I, I said a million, I think you said 850,000. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know uh, what impact it had on that other program. It doesn't. Okay, thank you. Mr. Papa? Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Do we have a system or a consultant that is tracking and is able to somewhat project the cost of uh, natural gas and has access to tell us what our provider is actually paying for that gas on in, in the in the in the marketplace uh, no we don't uh, you know the electricity is traded as a commodity and so that pricing is available out there in the marketplace but I, I've seen some really advanced models that track it I mean, track a lot of other uh, things, just like, I mean, just uh, like they, they trade the, uh, track the stock market, and I know uh, you can't predict it, but you can have some idea of is it going to continue to trend down, or is it now, you know, getting ready to spike up? We don't, we don't have anything like that, or we don't no, have consulting uh, our, by that. No, our indication is when we have our energy manager uh, uh, does follow the trends, and uh, that's why we're here to you uh, tonight, because uh, we, we see it has it is trending down. It's begun to spike a little bit in the past week, but uh, 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 we feel like uh, we'll be able to go gather some good pricing here in the next couple of months. Projections, uh, I've had some conversations. Projections are uh, for the next two to three years, natural gas pricing, natural gas costs, uh, prices are gonna go way up. And when that happens, our electricity will. So it would be prudent for us to try to try to gather a couple more years on that contract if we can. Sure, with them being so so low, the, the expectation is that they can could right. only go up, just kind of right. like our interest rates. Yeah. So. Okay, thanks, Dr. Rush. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, I don't know if this would be for you, Mr. Carlisle, or Ms. Casas, or Ms. Castillo, from a legal standpoint. I, is there anything that we can do? in relation to these electric contracts, electricity contracts, or any others really for that matter, uh, where we would get uh, not necessarily a decrease in the rate because it is a, a commodities type of uh, exchange, but uh, to do uh, a, 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 uh, a credit or an additional uh, cash or revenue uh, to us or some other form of discount by us stating that X company is the preferred electric provider for AISD? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, it, it, I, I'm just thinking as far as revenue generation, community partnerships, things along the lines of our strategic planning that uh, that might be something for us to look at. I, I don't know if anybody's done it. I mean, mm -hmm. not no, at the public haven't. education level, obviously. We certainly could look into that, but I, I don't know of any programs uh, like that that would be uh, to our advantage. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thanks. I need a motion. I make a motion that uh, we follow the administration's um, Recommendation on uh, the electricity uh, contract extension. Second. 
motion by Mr. Hibbs, second by Mrs. Pena to uh, go with the administration's recommendation on the uh, electricity contract extension. That includes uh, giving the superintendent uh, the right to sign the contract at the right time. Okay, any further discussion? Please vote. All voting the affirmative. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is to consider possible action regarding closed session discussion regarding student and consultation with board's attorney relating to pending litigation of petitioner versus Arlington Independent School District, Texas Ag Education Agency docket number 111-SE-1211. Administration uh, recommends the uh, item discussed in executive session. Is there a, is there a motion? To I have a motion. Okay. I move that we approve the superintendent's action on behalf of the district in the proceeding petitioner versus Arlington Independent School District, Texas Education Agency, docket number 111-SE-1211 as recommended by the administration and the board's attorney. Motion by Mr. Barron, second by Mr. Hogg. Any discussion? Please vote. All voting in the affirmative, the motion passes. Thank you. Next is uh, item E, consider and possible action regarding closed session discussion, discussion regarding OCR case number 06111416. This one goes to me. I move to give the superintendent the authority to finalize an agreement with OCR subject to the revisions discussed in closed session with the general counsel. Second. Motion by Mr. Barron, second by Dr. Reich. Any discussion? Please vote. All voting in the affirmative, the motion passes. Next item on the agenda is items to with, be withdrawn from the consent agenda. Are there any items to be withdrawn from the consent agenda? President Barron, I request that we consider separately item C-12-57, C, uh, C uh, the keyless entry system. Any other items? We will pull uh, C-12-57, C the keyless entry system for separate discussion. Tonight we will be considering the items listed on your agenda under consent items. Mrs. Powell, please share <coughs> donations and bids. Yes, thank you. Uh, President Barron, board members, Mr. McCullough, good evening. Um, we do have seven bids on the consent agenda now for your consideration. And in all cases, the administration recommends the lowest bids and the bids representing the best value to the district. Uh, it's also my privilege to report uh, that our schools have received donations from the following individuals and organizations. The Arlington High School Football Booster Club, the Arlington High School Alumni Association, Mary Pettigrew, Arlington High School Baseball Booster Club, Jeffrey Hansen, Attorney at Law, Arlington High School Cheerleader Booster Club, the Arlington High School Girls Track and Cross Country Booster Club, Standard Utility Construction, Cravens Wildman Concessions Corporation, North Arlington Education Alliance, Lamar High School PTA, Lamar High School Girls Soccer Booster Club, Lamar High School Band Booster Club, Lamar High School Softball Booster Club, the Tarrant County Medical Society, Martin High School Orchestra Booster Club, the Martin High School Football Booster Club, SPJST Youth Club Lodge 183, the Arlington Alliance for Youth, Inc., Anonymous Donor, Susan and James Dancer, Shackelford Junior High School Girls Athletic Booster Club, 
Classic Designs Recognition Services, Beckham Elementary School PTA, City Med, Spring Creek Barbecue Number no. 1, Doctors Alexander Orthodontics, Carla Brown, Creative Education, Arlington Kiwanis Foundation, Arlington Skadium, Grissett Enterprises, West Elementary School PTA, and Jeff McCurdy. Our total donations presented for your consideration this evening are $69,748, which brings our year-to-date total to $509,844. Thank you, Mrs. Powell, and thank you to our most generous community for their extreme generosity. We sure appreciate it. Is there a motion to accept the consent with the exception of item, there you go, 12-57. Move to approve with the withdrawal of the one item. Second. Motion by Mrs. Pena, second by Dr. Rice to approve the consent with the exception of item 12-57. Dr. Rice. Uh, Ms. Powell, I just had a question on item D. Uh, the purchase is greater than 50000 exempt from bid. Uh, the first and third items, the band uniforms and the gymnasium floor refinishing, are those uh, uh, funding sourced from our bond? Uh, the gym floor refinishing is out of general operating fund, and the band uniforms is out of bond funds. Is the bond. Okay. Thanks. Please vote. All members present voting in the affirmative. Uh, passes 6-0. Mr. Pump had to step out for a minute. Next, we'll consider item 12-57, uh, Dr. Reich. Thank you, President Barron. Uh, we, we had some discussion in our uh, uh, work session uh, prior to this uh, regarding the, the uh, uh, keyless entry, there, there were some things presented uh, that led me down the road of do we want to, do we have to approve this tonight or is this something that needs a little bit further study? I'm, I'm all for it. I think it's a good idea. Uh, Ms. Powell, I had a question for you. Uh, you. You stated that one of the necessities in, in doing this this evening was the uh, uh, potential of the expiration of the Q scabs uh, as far as the funding source for this. And uh, I was wondering what other funding sources would be available or what else could we use those Q scabs for if we did not put this forth tonight? Uh, other funding sources uh, or other items that could be charged to the Q scabs could include uh, any sort of construction. Uh, any sort of renovation work to a school building. One thing you have to be very careful of with those qualified school construction bonds is uh, those were authorized uh, through the ARA program and you have to make sure that uh, the contractor meets the Davis-Bacon requirements for prevailing wages. So there are certain types of projects where the prevailing wage rate for this area could be higher than what we would experience through a bid process and that would drive the cost of the project up. Um, and so that's something we would have to look at very carefully. But um, there are some other things we are doing right now that could potentially be charged to these qualified school construction bonds. Okay. Yeah, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is, you know, part of our discussion earlier was centered around how this is going to be implemented and if the front doors of the campuses were going to be remain unlocked at all times or locked except for before uh, before school after school uh, immediately as far as the bells go and we had differing answers it seemed that the the majority was that those doors are going to be locked after uh, a certain time uh, after before the bell or right after the bell in the morning and the question was brought up what about the parents outside the door at that point? And so there, we didn't get real clear answers on uh, uh, security cameras that they are already in place and available. If there's uh, 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 bells or intercom systems that are set up uh, or could be set up uh, to work with that as our procedure. And I'm, I'm thinking that it would maybe be more financially prudent to look at the, the complete analysis uh, for that, whatever that process is going to be, so that if we do have to 
get more security cameras or we do have to have uh, intercoms installed, uh, wh whatever it may be, that perhaps we would actually end up achieving a lower uh, contract price to bundle all that together versus piecemealing it with this now if we approve it tonight versus okay now we have to come back to the board for cameras or intercom systems that's a whole different thing so I I would urge that if there's a way to, to do that and still utilize the uh, QSCAB dollars for other purposes that maybe the board consider that and, and holding off on this uh, this item right now at this this point this evening I, I do and Mr. Surley is here and I think he can answer the question better than I can about how the system is designed but um, uh, there is not a buzzer that would be on those keypads uh, they're readers uh, card readers uh, on the doors and I think the idea is that um, you know those doors are locked uh, and anyone who needed to access the building would have to come to the front doors and so Mr. Surley I'll let you answer that Right, that, that is correct that the uh, readers that are in the proposal is just a reader like on the front door here uh, with, without any buzzers or intercom systems integrated into it. Uh, that if an employee needed into the building, they could come open the door with a card. So is it your plan uh, to not have these at the front doors then? Uh, when the proposal came out, the uh, footprints of the campuses were uh, given to the principals and the principals were afforded the opportunity to select which doors that they wanted on their campus for the controlled access doors. So some did select a front door, others did not. Okay. For those that did a front door selection, what, what's the plan then? Uh, using that as the example, if that door's locked, what's a parent going to do to get in? The plan that, that I'm aware of is that the front door would be open during school, normal school hours, and then that door would be an access door past school hours for the keyless entry. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I still would feel a little bit better if we had more. Uh, a complete implementation plan in place before we we sign off on it. Uh, it there's there's uh, just too many variables in my opinion of it might be this it might be that and I think for us as a governing body it's important to make sure that everything is accounted for uh, as much as possible uh, prospectively versus retro. So thank you, Mr. Shrek. Mr. Hibbs. Dr. Rice and I uh, generally agree 99.9% .9 of the time. I, I, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a different path on this one, thinking, uh, Mr. Surley, right now, currently all the front doors that we are, all the doors that we have on these primary campuses um, all have cameras as you're entering the building. Is that correct? Or into the hallways that are going into those? The not all of them. The, the cameras have different viewpoints at different schools. Some of the cameras, uh, I would say the vast majority of them would have an interior camera pointing towards the office and the front vestibule area. Then some of the campuses will have, say if they have an awning or one, a general view of the front of the school, it's a more generalized view instead of a close up on the door so that they kind of encompass their whole front entry area. Okay. I've been in four schools this week and, and in each one of those on the entry way in because I was I was evaluating or just looking at the Raptor right. system uh, see, and because many of the schools are actually advertising it on their little marquees that you need an ID to enter the school at this point. Right. There are actually signs on the front doors that actually say uh, you have to have your ID if you want to enter into the school so yes, uh, and everything is being directed through the um, uh, into the office when you come into the building but what I did notice and I was looking at the uh, cameras at Miller Elementary just today and I noticed that in the front door with with the one do door that would be remain uh, uh, unlocked during the course of the day that the camera showed the entry area and then directly through the doors. 
That's the vast majority, yes. Sir. Okay, that's what, that's what I was assuming that the vast majority is. So we already have cameras that are uh, basically in place at probably where 90% of the open doors are gonna be, is right, um, um, right there in the front of the school. It would be leading into the offices. Correct. Okay, uh, and this is the only reason I, I think that we go ahead and move on, on this is I do believe that we have that point of security in place. I believe that with the Raptor system, we have the uh, check-in system in place. And what this is going to do is it, it, it's a, uh, from my understanding of this, is it, it's expandable. But you also have the ability to uh, do, get very creative with the, the uh, entry passes. You can make it from six to six. You Absolutely. Know, so people can't come back in at 8:30 if they're if they're not if they don't have that um, ability to. Uh, there was a question that Miss uh, Pena asked today that I thought was very valid too. That uh, if a substitute was on campus, the the uh, campus um, if it's up it's up to the principal, but the principal could actually offer maybe even a day pass to a substitute that would be in a temporary building to have access to come in. That would be a solution, yes. Right. Okay. I believe that this is something that the administration has been working on. We're, we're approaching, did you say, Ms. Powell, the two-year point or the three-year point on this one? You have to spend those QSCAP bonds within three years, and three years for us is December, and so uh, we're closing in on that. Okay. I know that we're closing into it, and um, I think that the we're at the potential uh, point where we can go ahead and move forward with getting the um, the system secured. It sounds like we still need the minutia, the basics, the step-by-step -step, um, uh, pieces put to, together and understanding the components. But, uh, but the system itself, I believe, uh, is in place and we can move forward. Mr. Hogg. Thank you, President Barron. Mr. Charlie, let me ask, is this, uh, are we leading to hopefully a no-key system? It would be up to, I guess, the wishes of the board and the administration. Uh, this system would be expandable. It will go into the future with us, and it does have the capabilities to introduce a lot of different technology should we choose to do that. Because um, right now, a, right now, a teacher is assigned a key to the building and a key to their classroom. Yes, I believe so. Is that correct? So right now, they could in essence not be assigned a key to the building, but just one to their classroom. Correct. Hopefully. Yes. So it is the leading to hopefully no keys. We're, we're uh, not we're not saying we're putting in place a keypad reader in every classroom right now. Correct. Correct. It's okay. exterior doors. Exterior doors, select doors. Um, I do have a little concern. While I do trust our principals, knowing their schools probably better than anyone else, I do also trust you and the security department, knowing security better than anyone else. When, when they sent in that approval of the doors they chose, was that reviewed and, and approved by you guys? Or did you, because my concern is a principal not knowing exactly how the keypad system is going to work. And they're like, well, let's just put it on the front door and I think that's Dr. Reich's concern, which when he brought that up, it's a good point because I don't know if front door is always the perfect place, but it could be. So I'd ask, did you review these and, and do you offer recommendations to the principals? Yes, we did discuss this with the principals. Uh, we made some minor changes uh, to that when it didn't make sense. Uh, and we did have some discussions whether they truly wanted it this for other purposes you know, after hours access, depending on the layout of the school uh, and the, their traffic pattern for their teachers and uh, in and out of the building, that was taken in consideration where large numbers of teachers would be coming in and out because of the design of the building. So those things were taken in consideration, yes. And this system we're approving, if we switch vendors two years from now, we're st it's still gonna be flexible enough and have the concepts in place it's still going to work no matter who we're using. Yes, it would be. Uh, it's a pretty standard system. Yes. Industry standard, I guess, is my 
my real question. The magnets yes. they're putting on the door, the ID badges, if we put this system in place right now, two years from now, we're going to be like, well, we can't get any kind of ID badge. It's just an RFID chip, correct? Right. It's non-proprietary. Perfect. That's the answer. That's the wording I was looking for, Mr. Shirley. I love hearing non-proprietary. That means others can use this. I think this is a, Dr. Reich, I think your concerns are very valid. I think this is a start of a very long-term program. Mr. Shirley, I think with you and Mr. Walker having to really pick apart how we're utilizing the ID systems, um, I think this is the perfect way to solve the solution. We put a lot of money into the Raptor of having every single person with a standardized ID in our schools so they're very identifiable. I think that is the key, and this is one of the steps to that next step, and I don't think it's the solution to all. I don't think it's the last time we'll discuss this. Um, I, I personally think we're ready to move forward. Mrs. Pena. Uh, my question is, I, I mean, I live this every day. Where I work, we have to scan in, scan out, scan in, scan out. And we've had the same system for 15 years. And in the 15 years, we've only had to get one door magnet replaced once. But ours also allows us to go into parking. And that one breaks down quite a bit. But it's opening a huge gate. Right. So my question to you is on the, um, ours is so far 15 years, uh, what kind of, um, history does this system have? Because I notice these are slender or fit whatever door that's like when you come into this building. Correct. Th these are slender, and I've seen the slender ones, but um, what kind of history does it have in repair? It, the, what the proposal is is the same as this building on the exterior doors. It's called a strike lock. Um, from what's been reported, they're very durable. and. You know, once it's put in uh, and wired through, then if a component goes bad with it, you just remove that one piece and replace that one piece. Okay, and everybody keeps saying wiping, uh, wiping your card. Mine just, you just put it in front of it and it... Yeah, it's a so proximity it's, card. Right. So, good, because that's less wear and tear as well. Correct. Okay, that's all I had. Uh, and we've, we had a lot of our questions answered in the work session. Either, Mr. Charlie. Um, do majority of teachers in the buildings have keys to the front door of the building? I don't know the answer to that. I, I kind of got that from what you were saying earlier. That's my understanding that the, the principal in their building selects who has uh, exterior door keys. Okay. Uh, and then did you say that the, some of the principals elected not to have the front door have the key reader on it? Yes. It depends on parking, where most of the teachers would come in, employees would come in, uh, because uh, most your, like some elementary schools, I know the, the main parking is at the back of the building, mm -hmm. and then the front doors are, you have the circle that only parents are taught, you know, parking in, and so, uh, when teachers come, they would park on the back side if they got there early, and so they would use their key to, you know, to get in before the normal time. It just seems to me like we'd want one on every front door. It again, I, he, as Mr. Shirley was saying, it's traffic patterns, mm -hmm. and they each principal looked at it and y'all reviewed it. Uh, there are some schools that uh, you know, the front door just not used very often by the staff. And it can be expandable to okay. add anything that we want to to the system. So if it came that they wanted to add the front door, then it would just be a matter of wiring that front door and, and making one addition. It's a, totally expandable. Mr. Barron, and, and in your point, if school starts at 730 and that automatically opens the door, nobody has to go over there and you see somebody with a key or whatever on the inside trying to open that door, that would make perfect sense to have one at the front door where it deactivates to open that door. I don't know that we'll have that capability at all. Well, that's what they're going to do for the ones that are at the front when it deactivates when school starts. That's my understanding. Are we that going would to have be the a capability, capability of the front office to unlock the, the door part. from the front office without going to the door and opening it? 
There, that, there's a couple here. different ways to go about that. You can set uh, parameters on the time that the door will lock and unlock, just like this building here. Mm -hmm. Or you could pin the exit device or the crash bar to where it stays locked and in case of a lockdown, then all you'd have to do is unpin that door and then it would be locked and the only pre people who could get in would be the ones who are card holders instead of having to then go and into the computer and then lock that door via computer. Okay, I guess the reason for my initial question was I was thinking of security going to visit a building in the nighttime. They'd have to have a master key or they'd have to have a master swiper. That is correct. They do, they do the have, door. they do, our security has access to any building that's on, that, that, that are on duty at that time. Right. But this would require them that they have to go to the back door or whatever the door was that had the swiper on it. Well, the, the, the elementaries, I think, had four selected doors, the junior high is six, and the high school's 12. So any of those uh, doors that were set up like that. Okay. Dr. Reich. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barron. Um, what happens when power goes out? Those are sec uh, fail secure doors. When the power goes down, the door stays secure. Okay. With uh, the uh, manufacturer that you're recommending tonight or any of the others as part of the RFP or RFQ, I don't remember which one it was, process, was there uh, customer satisfaction data that you looked at for these products and for other users, as far as reliability, et cetera? Um, I'm not sure that I totally understand that question as, as far as the for, surveys. Well, did these companies, were they required to present reliability data for their other clients, their other users, uh, to show reliability, overall satisfaction with the product, breakdowns, that type of thing? Uh, I don't believe that that was a portion of the RFP. Okay. Okay. I still stand where I'm at. Mr. Pompa. Uh, thank you, President Barron. Following up on, on your question, so if they don't have the, the keyless entry set up in the front door, as some of these have chosen not to, does that mean they're going to have a regular key for that front door and a keyless system for the other doors? Correct. Not every employee has is issued a key. Okay, so I guess I'm still struggling with the, the, the whole concept of this, of this system. What was the reason that we even began considering the system? This was brought up, I guess, in, in the uh, 2009 bond, uh, for, by the bond committee. And before that, I believe it was even the uh, safety committee had, had looked at this years and years ago. Uh, this probably goes back to 06, 07, 08. It's been looked at for a long time. Well, what are we trying to accomplish with it today? Uh, my understanding of it is putting a system in place that can be expanded. I think when, when this was all put together as a package uh, in the 2009 bond committee, there was really uh, no idea what the cost would be um, until it was spec'd out and that it was put out for proposal. And so the amount of doors that were selected at each facility uh, were based on very loose numbers. And so now that we know what the hard numbers are for this proposal, um, the elementaries had four doors selected, junior high six, and the high school's 12. If the district saw fit to add to that, it would just be an adjustment of, of the bottom line to encompass all, all doors if they wanted to. Uh, there would be interior applications if that's the way the district wanted to go uh, on computer rooms or rooms that you wanted to then track who comes in and out with the card because then that would 
put a log in as who's coming and going and what times they're coming and going and be able to set parameters with the access card to uh, disallow entry at certain times or for certain personnel during periods of time is, is totally customizable. Yeah, no, I totally get what the uh, capabilities of the system are. I guess I'm trying to understand what we're trying to accomplish. Are we looking for safety? Are we looking just to have a really cool key system, key, keyless system uh, that has some interesting reporting capability or interesting limiting capabilities? Um, you know, but I, it just starts failing once you start looking at some of these things. I mean, it, it, safety, yes and no, because there's still regular keys, and so if somebody gets a hold of that regular key, they can come in at any time, whether it's they're supposed to come in or not. Uh, then not all the doors are going to be locked. Some doors are still going to be unlocked. So, you know, I'm just trying to understand what, what the whole concept is for because when, when I'm looking at it from a safety standpoint, I don't think it, it accomplishes that. Uh, if I'm looking at it from a control standpoint of, uh, of access to the schools, again, with the, with the concept that some doors are still going to have regular keys and some are going to have keyless entry, that, that kind of fails too. So. You know, we're looking at spending half a million dollars on this system, and I guess just operationally or strategically, I don't know what we're really accomplishing with that money, and I'm just trying to figure out what else we could spend half a million dollars on, as, as Dr. Reich brought up. Uh, the, the idea, I, I don't want to dis, discount all the work that you guys have already done with it, but I wasn't here then. I wasn't on the board, and I, I was not involved in those discussions, so I'm trying to understand what we're trying to accomplish other than having a pretty cool key system. That's it. I'm going to go with uh, Mrs. Pena first and then Mr. Hogg. Okay, I was on the committee he talked about, the Safety and Security Committee. And um, one of the reasons we uh, re made the recommendation to go to the key list was when uh, employees were uh, leaving the district, whether they be a substitute or not, and they took the key and did not turn it in, then either the whole, all the locks had to be changed or they continued to have access to the building. So there was a, it was a, um, not a good way to control access to the building. With this system, that was one of the reasons I asked, is there a termination of the use of the card? And this system will provide that so that if the even if they don't turn that card back in, they can be taken off the system and the system doesn't have to be changed. My understanding though, and, and that was one of the things I said in the work ses session was that the processes in the schools are too different and I don't agree with that. I think that either all the front doors should have them or none of the front doors should have them. I think we need some standard procedure in place that is even for the security people, if you you got to know where to go, and if it's all you know, you can get in in that front building, the front of that building. Then you go to the front of the building. If something's happening and you're trying to get in there, you need to know where to go. So I think a standard location of the of those should be in place. The um, one of the other reasons we came up with this was, and I'm hoping we move toward that, because I didn't hear this mention, Mr. Hogg kind of alluded to us eventually getting there, was we had a period, I don't know if it was three years ago, where we had a rash of computers that were stolen. And in that rash of computers, um, we couldn't tell what was going on readily. Uh, I know we have cameras, but sometimes, it, I mean, my daughter told me in her school she knew where every camera was. I think most students know where they are, so why wouldn't the employees know, or anybody else, for that matter? So if we have, let's say, a computer room or a computer class, one of the keyless uh, entries are there. So only certain people can open up that room to teach, and those computers are at least secure in that area. And then I think we secure uh, some of the computers in the summertime in central locations. That area has secure. And in my office, we have a control even so that you can't go into certain areas such as I can't go um, into our office of council, which we would kind of, we try to control who can get in and out and have access to our internal auditor's information. So it would limit who can go in and out 
of certain locations. So there is more than just having a cool system. It's more of a, a, a control mechanism to make sure that we secure our equipment, provide the safety to the, to the campus, and, but again, I'm with you on the, all this thing about the keys and so on. We need to make sure it's a centralized. So I don't have a problem with purchasing the system. I have a problem with there isn't a, the minutia, as Mr. Hibbs um, described it. There has, somebody has to deal with that, and it needs to be standard, and it needs to make sense. This doesn't make sense to me to have it in different locations. So Mr. Pompa's question about or I don't know, was it Mr. Pompa or Ms. Solins, who, who was advising who on where the location of these keyless entries should be? It could, because it doesn't sound like anybody was giving any kind of a standard recommendation. That's, that's the only that's concern Ms. I have. Pena, a quick question. Uh, so as it's being proposed, do you think it's accomplishing those, the driving factors that pushed you to say, yes, let's put this in, in place? Uh, the the key control yes the the um, standardized thing I think that needs to be reviewed I think they need to come up with a process that's more standard so that we know that they have it in the front the back and I don't have a problem with having it for easy parking access that makes sense to me as well so you know whatever the four are they need to be standard on each of our campuses for the elementary standard on each of the campuses for the junior high and it's going to be more difficult to do that at the high school level, but they need to be strategically located. Somebody needs to know um, what the right hand is doing while the left hand is doing it. And that doesn't sound like that's what we're doing as far as where they go. I'm, I'm ho I, right now, we're just voting on the system, and I'm for the system, and I think it's going to do, accomplish the job. But I think it, there's a little bit more work needing to be done here. I think it, to answer part of that, when we did look at the footprints, you know, we considered the north, east, north, east, south, and west, and that so that all directions would have access. That was a consideration, and that was one of the parameters that we tried to accomplish with with all the schools, not so that they would all be bundled on one side that the the different sides had access. I guess my point is, if one, if you put them in a different location, and let's say you send. You send uh, Joe, Joe security guy to the school, and then the next day you send him to another school, and it's at late at night to go check because something's going on, and then they have to search where it is they're supposed to go to to get in. You know, because I do know sometimes they have to go to the schools late, late at night and go walk the school, but they need to know where they're going. And not if every school is not the same, then there's time lost, and what's the point of sending somebody? Or, or that's the case too. Make every door keyless. I mean, mm -hmm. at, at some point. Yes. Mr. Hogg. Thank you, President Barron. Ms. Pena, points are right on. Um, Mr. Shirley, this is going to eliminate for 99% of staff external keys to the building, correct? I would believe so, yes. Yes. It does what Ms. Pena says. So I, I think we can't forget. If this was one keyless entry per school, we'd have an issue. I'd be like, did we put a cool pad in there just to make it cool? We're putting 12, 6, and 4 in each building. It's, and the principals are saying, here's from our teacher's park, here's from our teacher's park, that are showing up at 6.30 or 7 a.m. when the building's not open to students yet, and they need to be able to be accessible. Right now, they're assigned an external key and a room key. We're eliminating the external keys. The other thing it does from a safety factor is if you walk around campus right now, unfortunately, not enough of our teachers are wearing their ID badges constantly, especially in the elementary level. This is creating, because I know Mr. Walker's working on it with Mr. Surly, a standardized ID badge. And if you're using this to get into your building, it's amazing how that always encourages and pretty much causes you to be wearing your ID badge because it's your entry to the building. It's your entry when you take your kids out to recess and you're bringing them back in to have that instead of having to carry those extra set of keys with you to get in and out. So I think beyond it being a system, it is leading to external keys, which will in turn reduce our cost, 
keys, it also gives us that safety factor of knowing exactly who is in our buildings at 6 p.m. on a Sunday. Which teacher is up there working in case something occurs, we have that report to see exactly who is in there, who accessed those, because they're not going to have external keys and you can very easily go back and see exactly who is in that. Um, I don't have a problem, as Ms. Pena said, of having possibly, you're doing 12, 6, and 4, each building, the front door, you could very easily, Mr. Shirley, say each building, the front door needs to have a keypad. That kind of makes sense. I also buy into our security guards are going to know where to go at each one, so I can go either way on that. Mr. Shirley, and, and you probably don't know this, what would it cost for every external door to have this? I, I really don't know. I mean, you could How many more doors are we talking about? A lot. A bunch. So this is a scalability, truly, system now. Yes. We're scaling for initial entry, we're getting rid of external keys, and then we can start scaling towards the other element of eventually going completely keyless. Correct. Uh, I believe this RFP bid was way under the allotted funds, um, so it would just be up to the administration and the board how they wanted to spend those other funds. Eliminating external keys is enough for me of why this is worthwhile from a safety perspective, not only outside of our schools, inside of our schools. Mr. Barron, whenever you're ready, I'm ready to make a motion. I got one minute. Okay. I need to get something clarified. Is that across the district, during the school day, every school has their front door unlocked. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. At least, at least one front least door one. is unlocked. That's okay. Mr. Hibbs. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Pompey, you asked the question, and I, and to be honest with you, I shouldn't have to be the one answering it, but uh, you asked the question, why, do we, why did we proceed this way? Ms. Pena gave you uh, the, the committee that she sat on. Ms. Sullins and I both sat on the Bond Advisory Committee, which is this board at the time approved the, component, the full components of this. Um, uh, you know, it still needed to go out to bid and still needed to be discussed, but, we, uh, but the whole reason that the, uh, the Bond Advisory Committee brought this and thought it was important to keep this in the bond package was for two things, safety and a deterrent system. We've, we've seen across the country uh, issues with um, schools being too accessible for people to come in. This gives us an opportunity to track, deter, and to avoid uh, certain issues. It, is it going to, is a fail-safe system? No, it's not. But you said, I'm, I'm concerned that we still have keys out there. We have to have keys regardless if we have this system because of, in order of a power failure. You're still going to have to open those doors. So you're going to have to have some kind of locking system. The system never goes down. You'll have to have a way to, to unlock the doors if you're going to try to re-enter the building. So there's always going to be a need for a key. Yeah, I just liken it to our homes that we have security systems in. We've got, a, we've got a key on our front door, but we've got a security system. I'm still going to lock my front door even though I've got my security system armed. Um, the keyless system allows for uh, not only what um, Mr. Hogg was saying, but it allows for uh, flexibility in monitoring and upgrades. The system can be upgraded. Um, and then finally, if a door is ajar on any one of these doors that the, uh, the security or the campus administrators uh, deem are the ones that they really believe need to uh, be uh, locked. They're going to be accessible by the most people. Th this is something I don't think we as a board should try to dictate to. They're, they're the ones that know the, uh, the issues on their individual campuses. We don't. We're not out to all 78 campuses. If a door is ajar under, under this keyless system, Currently, let's say if a door is ajar, and we know people do that, they put a book in the, in the door to keep the door open because they're running back out to the car for something. 
we have no way of knowing that door is ajar unless we physically walk up on it or we happen to catch it on camera. If a door is ajar with this system, beep, the little sound goes off. Somebody is alerted to the fact that the door is open. Beep. So I'm telling you, that's why I'm for this. The, 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 if I think that there was anything that the uh, bond advisory com committee voted in 100% unison on, it was for the security and safety of our kids, and that's what the system was. Mrs. Sullins. Just one quick question. Um, in terms of safety, since the we would be aware if the doors are open, that would, seems like it would improve our lockdown procedure because instantly if a school goes into lockdown, it would it seem to improve our safety. The, the principal could look or someone could immediately look and see that all doors are secure and much faster than we can in a non-keyless environment. Is that true? There would be a graphic map that the security dispatcher could pull up that would show the status of the doors, red or green, open, closed. Yeah. And uh, on a bank of doors, um, a value, add, value added portion of this, they can tie those other doors into that point. So if they had four doors, then each one of those doors could be contacted. And then if any one of those four doors, it would show that that point was open or closed. Thank you. Oh, no, oh Mr. Papa. I want to say thank you to Ms. Pena and Mr. Hibbs for the clarification. Um, you know, listening to the, to the explanations, I don't think I'm against the, the idea of the keyless entry. I, I don't think that what we're getting here is what, what the bond advisory committee was looking for when they proposed it. Um, we're, we're getting this piecemeal uh, process or uh, system but you know okay vote on this piece now and it's five five hundred thousand dollars it's a half a million dollars and and then you know later on we'll tell you how much the rest of it costs to really accomplish what what the bond advisory committee was looking for the safety the safety piece uh, a lot of the 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 the, the arguments or uh, not arguments but comments that people are making they're valid uh, but why didn't we just go ahead and get the whole the whole thing up here and say hey, this is the system that you guys propose this is how much it is and you know then we can say okay well let's let's start with this piece now and then we'll do another piece later that's just that's my comment that's all mr hogg thank you president baron move for uh, approval on item 1257 keyless entry system with the ad addition of one standard entry point at each location Second. Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Hogg, second by Mrs. Pena to accept item 12-57 uh, with the addition of one standard entry point at each location. Further discussion? Please vote. Motion passes 5-2. Next item on the agenda is the, end, the discussion of the MGT of America Cost Containment Update Options 2-16 through 3-8. Mr. McCullough. I believe there's 10 uh, items here we want to bring back to the board just to uh, give a review and Dr. Boxes. President Barron, members of the board, Mr. McCullough, this evening we'd like to present the 10 options for MGT, the following 10. To close out Chapter 2, uh, 2.16 was consider, consider implementing the study we had done on special ed staffing to reduce the special ed staffing, and we have done that and actually uh, saved even more money than MGT recommended. 2-17 was to consolidate the IB program, and if you recall at the time that this report came out, there was also discussion by the board about IB, and so we delayed the implementation at Martin and at Seguin, and we have it at four sites, and we allowed transfers. Uh, that was the beginning of, of somewhat of a consolidation, and the board asked us to study um, other components of the IB, and that's been done, and you've received a report to that effect, and we're reviewing it with principals to determine uh, the changes we're going to make, including certificate programs and things like that. Mm 
Now moving into the third chapter on the MGT report, and this is the facilities chapter. Uh, the first uh, option was to adopt the instructional use model to calculate functional capacities at the district schools. Our capacities that we've been using were quite dated. Uh, we began this process in the spring, and uh, we have uh, updated now the junior high capacities, and this is hands-free at the moment. And, uh, and we are now working on the, uh, the junior high, uh, I'm sorry, the elementary capacities. We have uh, completed uh, uh, roughly 20 of those and we're continuing to work on those. Uh, the next one is considering, uh, consider closing some junior high schools or reconfiguring the grade configurations of the elementary and junior high schools. Um, and uh, what we have uh, at the moment is uh, we, we made a presentation to the board in November about uh, this possibility and uh, we have another presentation coming to the board at the board's request in, in March uh, on this particular topic. Uh, thirdly, then, increase the total reimbursements of user fees to a level that is equal to or above 12 cents per square foot. That has to do with our building rentals. We did make some adjustments on our building rentals, primarily on uh, some uh, football rental fees, and uh, we have implemented those already this fall. Uh, consider then, the next one, consider selling half of the undeveloped land parcels uh, the district currently owns. Uh, this is something that the board can certainly look at. Uh, we have um, eight pieces of property, undeveloped sites in different places uh, that the board has purchased over the years, and uh, that is something that if the board chooses to do that, uh, we can certainly look at that. Uh, conduct an annual custo uh, custodial customer satisfaction survey. Uh, we completed this in the fall. Uh, we sent the results to the board in uh, December, early January, I believe, and uh, the results were very positive. Uh, we asked five questions. Uh, we had 955 respondents to that survey, uh, and uh, the, the response was great, and the, uh, the results were quite good. Uh, Number six, establish cleaning supply budgets for all schools. Um, we had indicated to the board last spring we were not going to implement this particular one. The uh, recommendation was that we look at budgeting for custodial supplies on a per square foot basis. Uh, we budget based on the number of kids in the building because uh, the big cost there for us is paper products. Uh, and so we have some schools that, uh, as, as we know, have larger campus populations and enrollments. And so we feel like uh, we need to do it in this manner. We do budget for all the custodial supplies centrally for all the campuses. Uh, requests come through Mr. Carlisle's office and we monitor that very closely. Uh, we think that uh, we've got a good handle on that. Uh, consider adopting a policy that eliminates personal appliances from the classrooms and offices. Uh, this was discussed uh, by the board last spring and the board voted uh, not to implement um, a policy either eliminating personal appliances or requiring a fee to, uh, to have one. And then lastly, uh, for this evening, uh, install trash compactors at each school site and that was listed as an option. We have studied that. Uh, Mr. Carlisle and his group work with um, I think it was Republic, uh, on that, and uh, the waste disposal company here in town. And we've looked at the high schools. Uh, they're the only ones that have enough volume that warrant this because there's capital investment involved in uh, purchasing the, the trash compactors. Uh, what we have identified in a very detailed study with Republic is that um, we have three schools that could recognize some savings. One of those three is so small that it would take 11 and a half years to recoup our, our initial investment in the equipment. Uh, the other two are Arlington High and Seguin, and uh, the savings there would be a total of about $8,000 a year. And to have the equipment requires uh, about a, an $8,500 cash outlay uh, up front and, uh, for each site. And then you'd have to train the custodians on how to use the equipment, maintain the equipment, and clean the equipment itself. And so at, at this time, this is something that uh, we have looked at. Um, it's not something that we think is real cost beneficial to us. It's not something that we see as having uh, value to roll out to all schools. The uh, junior highs and the elementaries don't generate enough trash uh, that warrant this sort of investment. So uh, with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions. I got to go with the trash compactors first. Um, would these things be inside the building or outside? I believe they're outside. Uh, they'd be 35 cubic yard uh, uh, roll-off uh, exterior located dumpsters. Uh, they'd be compacted when they're full. Uh, they'd be unplugged 
uh, the waste hauler would come get them, dump them, bring them back. So would they take the place of a dumpster or? Uh, yes, sir. They would take the place of the existing dumpsters. Uh, the problem with that is is the, the size of them. They're 35 cubic yards. Most of ours are four, six, and eight cubic yard uh, dumpsters. So and so we'd that, have to create how, a spot for How many for parking them. spaces would one take? Uh, a bunch. It'd take, uh, what did we calculate? I don't, that's a one thing I don't have on my list. I, it's, about, it's about four, about four parking spaces. Okay, that's a bad idea. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pompa. Thank you, Mr. Bear. Um, just a, a reminder that uh, the Futures Finance Committee is going to be looking at all the recommendations from MGT. Um, so I just have two real quick questions uh, on the cleaning supplies, since it centrally managed the cost. Um, do the schools have the flexibility to say, hey, we'll, we'll use less and give us that money back to use in our regular uh, allotment? No, we have not rolled it into regular campus of allotments. Uh, what we find that we may have to do towards the end of the year is if we're running short in one location and we see that we still have quite a balance in another location, we may transfer those funds uh, but still keep them within the custodial supplies. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking just to incentivize schools to use less, hey, if you figure out a way to waste less paper, then you can have that money for your campus allotment might be a good sure, and idea. Sure, yeah, we can, uh, we can look at that. Uh, I think our, our custodians, we have a, a pretty set routine and, and standards, I would say, in how we stock our schools based on numbers of kids. And I think we have whittled at this budget uh, over the years such that there's really not much margin there. But yeah, absolutely, we could look at something like that. Just so that the schools that are better at utilizing the resources get the benefits from it. And, and the ones that don't, well, maybe that money comes out of their allotment so that, uh, anyway. Uh, and the recyclers, are they not, uh, a lot of times, like when I looked at putting one in my office, uh, the paper recycling company would, would pay for it and for we the, have for some the we have some recycling dumpsters, and we uh, a company comes and picks that stuff up, and that is saving us <coughs> some money on our uh, disposal costs because we pay that by the tip, and so by putting more paper in the recycling dumpster, then we reduce uh, the number of tips and thus reduce our cost. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, President Barron. Um, on these uh, trash compactors, I just want to make sure I, what I'm hearing is that you're you are looking <coughs> at doing the implementation at Arlington High and Seguin. I, I think what we have determined in looking at this is that the savings over a, a, a year's time is eight thousand dollars. <coughs> it will take us, um, I believe it's two and a half years at one of the schools, and um, let's see if I can get that here. Uh, about that long at the. Yeah, it's, it's slightly over two years to recoup our money at one of them and right at two years on the other, and the savings is $8,000. Uh, what we have to do in the meantime, though, is train staff to use them correctly, um, and then, as Mr. Carlisle has indicated, the space requirements to take them uh, to place one of those. So we don't see that this is something that uh, um, is very cost beneficial. Okay, so currently, your stand is that we're not going to do it. And we, we still have it marked two. as studying, but uh, okay. what we have seen uh, even in the last uh, month as we've completed the study is that you know, there's only two schools where it, there's even a payback at right. all, and yeah. it's very, very small. And then given that with the turnover and the custodial staff and the, the need to retrain uh, folks, that, uh, that we just don't think that the cost benefit's really there for $8,000 a year. Okay. Um, and then I guess the other question that actually is coming from my <laughs> colleague here. Uh, safety, liability concerns as far as people putting things into these, is, is that taken yeah. into account versus just dumping into a, a non-mechanical dumpster? I, I think they're safe. I think they're fail-safe okay. uh, things to those. Okay. Uh, my biggest concern about them is if, if we're not going, you know, if we're going to limit the number of tips we have on those a month, then we've got all of our waste is going in there. We've got food waste going in there. And, you know, if we go from having a pickup every three days at uh, one school and it goes to once every other week, uh, <laughs> I don't, I, I think the health safety issue sure. there is potential. Sure. Okay. Okay. 
And then uh, I had a couple of quick questions on uh, two items. On item 3-3, Ms. Powell, could you repeat that? I kind of missed what, what you said, what we're doing there. Uh, Yes, 3-3 uh, is uh, has to do with rental rates. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the option was that we could raise our rental rates to generate more rental revenue. Um, we did adjust some of our rates this year. Right. Uh, first of all, we have, based on some survey data uh, in the last couple of years, we are high uh, in the area. And I hear repeatedly, especially from our athletic director, that we are high on rental right. rates. Um, so we did adjust the rate that we charge, the hourly rate for renting the junior high football fields for the football clubs, the, the peewee clubs. Uh, we also opened up Wildman and Cravens Field this year for the first time we're renting those out. And that's been successful. There's been some interest there. Uh, we have also adjusted the rates that we charge um, for uh, the labor costs, managers, um, uh, security, that sort of thing, to make sure, and custodians, make sure that, that those are appropriate. Uh, we have not adjusted uh, any of the interior building rentals that are designed mainly to recoup electricity costs because we were already more than recovering those costs and we know that our electricity costs are going to go down with our new contract, so we haven't made any adjustments there. Uh, now, I will tell you, I, the rentals, um, come through my office and the volume of those rentals is up uh, yeah. and so I think that, uh, that that we are generating a lot of interest out there and people do come to us daily yeah. lots of people to rent our facilities so uh, I think we're uh, in a good place with that right now great um, do you have uh, like Delta projections as far as our increase uh, net with the, uh, the increases that you mentioned? Just well, what, one thing, looking at last year was an unusual year. We had a very, a single very large uh, rental, the federal government, for a period of time in one of our buildings. And so if I back that out, um, I believe that, uh, that we are, and of course we've also transitioned our fiscal year, so there's two, two sure. months less in this period. Yeah. Um, I think that we are going to be uh, a little ahead of last year. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. It's great to hear that. And, and I will throw in one other thing that because we have now opened Wyoming and Cravens, we had uh, a tournament offense defense that uh, uh, participated or played at uh, in both of those stadiums uh, over the winter break. And I think we generated, I think it was about uh, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars at those Good. rentals, just that one event. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that they are interested in returning. Good, that's excellent. Yeah, I think that. The, the more that, that we can market these things, the greater the revenue will be, the better the benefit for everybody. Um, on item 2-16, I know that we are ahead, is what you stated, Dr. Cavazos. Uh, how, how far ahead? What, what's the number versus what's on uh, the sheet? Mr. Drollinger, do you have that on special ed? Okay. It's slightly ahead. I mean, it was 2.4, I think, that they recommended, and we got 2.5, I think. Um, well, I tried to come back up. I'm looking at, I don't know. Let's see. Oh, it's not up there. I don't it's have the actual paper thing. Okay, what do we have on here as far as 216? 2.5. Yeah, what uh, I, I was thinking what MGT had was the 2.536, what we currently have on our paper. Um, that was so the actual savings. They did an estimate of five-year 12.1. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, that's what I wanted to know. I was curious where we were on how positive. Okay, that's all I had. Good. Thank you. I would guess that uh, with the upgrade of the athletic facilities, our rentals will go up even more. Next item is the open forum for non-agenda items. This second open forum segment of the meeting provides citizens with an opportunity to address the trustees on any subject except personnel. This is not intended to be a discussion or a debate and trustees will not reply to the speakers. Derogatory comments aimed at an individual will not be tolerated. I have one card from the audience. When your name is called, please step to the podium. You will have five minutes to speak. A lighted timer on the podium will assist you in pacing your presentation. A yellow light will illuminate 
When there's one minute left for you to complete your presentation, when the red light comes on and the buzzer sounds, please end your presentation. Larry Shaw, subject is progressive discipline. Good evening, Mr. Shaw. Good evening, Mr. Baird, members of the board, superintendent. I totally realize that this is not my first uh, meeting before the board talking about sensitive subjects, and I will try to thread the needle. And I'm sure if I don't and I step over the line, Mr. Barron will be the first one to tell me that I've done that, and I will respect that. I have a beeper over there. Okay. Yeah. Now we got the ground rules thing. Today I delivered an email to you that outlined many of our concerns with what we call progressive discipline. As you know, we've been appeared before this board on several occasions talking about termination of teachers and how it seems that there are more terminations in this district than many other districts because it seems that we have no progressive discipline. Progressive discipline very simply says that you go up a chart and you make the punishment fit the offense. That you look at it and you say, okay, this is on this level or this level. And some people would be terminated, but some people would get conference summaries or warnings or reprimands or whatever. There was a case here that was tried that we tried to point out progressive discipline to no avail. It was a case that didn't need to be tried. It was a case that cost this district, I'll bet you, over $100,000. But it cost that teacher even more. Because when teachers are placed on administrative leave, right or wrong, basically their career has taken a major step back. I shared with you in the email this morning the questions that are on the Region 11 Consortium application. And those questions are such things, have you ever been placed on administrative leave? We deal with teachers every day who have been placed on administrative leave for investigation when they've done absolutely nothing wrong. And then later they are cleared. But they still got to answer that question, yes. In the old days, like last year or so, a teacher could go ahead and resign and they could go to another district. And the wink was, well, the board didn't tell you the, to resign. It was the administration or the principal that recommended that you resign. But if you look at those questions very carefully, now they say, have you ever resigned in lieu of termination? There's another part on that too that I didn't include and I should have, and that is the code of ethics for the teaching profession. And under the code of ethics, if you mislead a school district in your application, not only can you be fired for not telling the truth on, an, on a state document, but you now can have your certificate removed. So if you resign in lieu of termination, what happens is you're not out of a job, you're out of a profession. Now, the standard for termination is just cause. Not only just cause in this district, but just cause in similar situated districts as well. So you have to look at that and say, well, not only should this teacher be fired in Arlington, but should they be fired in Fort Worth or wherever the similar situated district is? That's a high standard, to be really honest with you. That's a higher standard than non-renewal or a higher standard than a probationary contract. <coughs> It's a bad process for the school district. It's a bad process for the teacher. And in this particular case, it was a bad process for the students because this was a wonderful teacher. It was something that we regretted and something that we've got to work through because if you have 10 or 15 of these in a year, you could be spending a million and a half to two million on defense, which we don't want to see either. The sad thing too, this is not covered as we understand in the retainer. This is additional expense that has to be included. Now, we're willing to work with the district, and we work with the district constantly since we represent 84% of the members. Uh, we meet with principals. We work through situations on a daily basis. But sometimes the call is just not right. Sometimes the progressive discipline is not the right. We've got to see sometimes that there are grays, not only black and white, that sometimes there are shades out there that you should see. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. That brings us to our superintendent's report, Mr. McCullough. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. We have some uh, good news tonight. Uh, Beckham Elementary has been recognized by Cook's Children's Medical Center as a Project Adam Texas Heart Safe Pro School. In Project Adam are an automated defibrillators in Adam's Menry is a program at Cook's Children that is working to assist schools implement their AED and sudden cardiac arrest emergency programs to prevent sudden cardiac death in schools. And this is a, a something that Beckham has worked on and, and it's a great program and they've had several uh, uh, similes and uh, 
different programs out there that I've attended that uh, the cooks came out and uh, awarded them uh, certificates for their outstanding work in this. Now the next one uh, is one that I'm, I'm excited to announce tonight. Seven million dollars. We were notified yesterday that we've been selected to receive a seven million dollar Texas Literacy Initiative grant to improve school readiness and success in areas of language and literacy for disadvantaged students birth through grade 12. Uh, we're the largest district in North Texas to receive this grant and uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, money that we that we will need to spend in the next couple of years and uh, we will use the literacy line models it's a, it's a vertical collaborative among the feeder pattern campuses in the Lamar and Sam Houston networks and this will provide instructional and programming alignment for language pre-literacy and literacy development and ease the transition for children across their entire learning careers so uh, we were uh, Dr. DeVos came in to see me yesterday afternoon and he was excited and uh, I want to thank our staff and uh, Sylvia Nichols our grants coordinator uh, for putting us all together and getting it in and uh, seven million dollars is a lot of money and uh, so uh, uh, this is a federal federal grant and uh, we're excited about it now this one's pretty good too this one is pretty good I don't know if we got a picture going up tonight or you lost the picture well, I hope you take a few moments. I want to take a few moments tonight to recognize board vice president Bowie Hall. Oh, no. <laughs> if you didn't see the Arlington Citizen Journal yesterday, <laughs> Bowie witnessed a car accident last Friday, and he was late to a meeting that we were having. And uh, but uh, he's he he witnessed a car accident where the driver at fault left the scene. And after checking on the other driver, Bowie followed the other car and convinced them to return to the scene until the police arrived. And I think it was uh, titled Notable, uh, Notable and Quotable. So, Mr. Hogg, uh, uh, I mean, really, I, I, I salute you for your uh, community service there and uh, helping this other driver out. Uh, because I'm sure he got back and they were able to exchange insurance information and different things and so uh, you know you're you're laughing but I, I really want to say thank you and that, that was uh, be up be of and beyond and so uh, uh, it's a great uh, tribute to uh, your uh, just your service to our community so thank you very much so and that concludes my report so. Thank you, Mr. McCollum. Board members' reports. Mr. Hibbs, you're first. No, you're last. <laughs> Mr. Hogg is my hero. <laughs> hey, uh, I mentioned earlier tonight uh, when we were talking about the uh, the security system. I, I was able to be in four different elementaries this week, and uh, I mean they're top notch. Uh, uh, Ashworth, uh, Miller, Ditto, uh, Webb. Uh, all of them, I, I, I just wanted to see how the Raptor system w worked uh, for the people that put in the hard work with the uh, Bond Advisory Committee, you know, those that are in the CBOC now, which is the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Um, this was something that was asked for as the security process uh, to move forward. I'm happy to say that uh, with the Raptor system, there's nothing but praise that's coming back uh, from the uh, uh, the front desk, which quite frankly I thought would be a little bit resistant. That's a little bit of extra work, but you know what? They see the um, uh, the how the system really helps their school, and it's it is a deterrent. It it it's already been able to um, uh, have success in deterring someone from being on a campus already. Um, and from, for that, uh, I, I, I thank the board that we move forward on that this year. Thank the administration for having it uh, put in place. Uh, and then also I want to uh, 
so Mr. Hogg's head doesn't get too big, I want to give accolades uh, to uh, the superintendent and to uh, Ms. Sullins. Um, and I would tell you that Ms. Sullins is probably our most uh, proactive in wanting to see a joint uh, uh, work done with uh, some of our local colleges and TCC. Uh, she, she has done tremendous uh, work with this. The superintendent was able to um, get a, arrange a meeting and invited some board members uh, to um, join uh, with TCC's new president at the Southeast campus, uh, Bill Coppola. Um, and we were able to meet with some of his staff. Uh, I've actually said it would be great that we have a, um, a uh, work session with them, um, with our administration and theirs uh, to see all the potential offerings. Uh, there's some exciting things that's happening and uh, what I want people to realize is that this district is progressively moving forward. We've got a very strong strategic plan that's being put in place. We worked all weekend um, uh, this past weekend, and then uh, I, I can't take credit for the weekend prior to that, but the rest of the board members were all in attendance and uh, were able to work on a strategic plan that's gonna be introduced in this district that's going to uh, really move us forward and um, uh, Mr. Hogg, Mr. Pompa, I don't know who else is on that committee, Ms. Sullins or Dr. Reich, exactly. Um, these people are working hard. Every board member up here, I've just got to throw kudos out to work circles around me and the administration, I appreciate what you're doing. Mr. Hogg, a rebuttal. No rebuttal, Mr. Barron. I heard when there's good things said about you is keep your mouth shut. I'll just, I'll leave out the part of, and I think my Star Telegram fans and writers for not uh, revealing that I did have 911 on the phone and the part of I was being scared during the process. And, you know, did I chase after him? Yes. Was it two blocks? Yes. Um, but I'll, I'll just take it and say, Mr. McCall, thank you for the nice accolades. <laughs> Mrs. Pena. Well, you mentioned the strategic planning, so I won't mention that, that we all worked very hard, but thanks. Uh, PTA Founders Day, there were uh, quite a few of us there. And uh, I wanted to um, remind everybody, if they didn't know, that they would know that tomorrow, the Arlington Dental Health Association that provides a lot of services to our kids will be having a Love That Smile, um, it's a dining, dancing, and silent auction. That's how they uh, get funding to support the low cost that they uh, do charge people that can pay and to fund um, the services that they're able to provide. The dentists who are on that board um, donate their time uh, and their talent. It's at Casherell tomorrow night. Hope to see you all there. I hope the public comes to support it because it's sure doing a lot of great things for the kids in the AISD. Thank you. And I guess for the last couple of days, I've been at the National Association for Bilingual Education. An interesting group, uh, great speakers. I'm learning all kinds of interesting things that I can use with my uh, students that now that I'm ESL trained. And, uh, good bunch of people exciting times that's it for tonight mr secretary do you have anything we have to remember i'm not sure if this is it i only have one hold on there we go i only have one item listed which was what you requested uh, president Barron, on identifying the number of uh, late arrival and early dismissal periods uh, to bring back at the next meeting and your backup concurs with you. <laughs> That's, That's it, folks. We're done. Thank you very much.